2018, my grade 8 self, who was, I think, 13, started reading the Throne of Glass series by Sarah J. Mass. I proceeded to read all of the books, excluding The Assassin's Blade, Tower of Dawn, and Kingdom of Ash. I read all the way up to Empire of Storms in the series, and then DNF'd every book after that. And since then, it has been one of my biggest goals to finally finish this series because it's just sitting on my shelf staring at me into my soul being like you were so close so close to finishing it and you didn't so this summer i intend to finish this series once and for all and that starts with throne of glass because i have actually read the assassin's blade now so we don't have to include the assassin's blade because i think i read it last year and that's recent enough that i remember enough of it that i don't need to reread it because the less books i need to reread the better because this is a long ass series so i am starting with throne of glass i'm actually 95 pages into this already so this is what we're tackling in today's video and i promise you nobody is going to stop me from achieving this goal. Not even my worst enemy, myself. So welcome to Bailey finally finishing the Throne of Glass series after four years. This vlog is going to be filled with spoilers, so if you haven't read the series and you are invested in not knowing anything about it, this ain't it for you. Come back when you've read it, or come back when you don't care anymore. Um, and I'm gonna synopsize it in one sentence because this is gonna be spoilers, so I don't really need to synopsize it, but basically, this is the first book in a fantasy YA series following Selena Sardothian, a world-renowned assassin who a year ago was captured and sent to a slave camp and since then has been mining away in this slave camp. Um, until one day the crown prince uh, comes and asks her to be his champion in his father's competition for a assassin basically and then after a few years if she wins the competition she'll win her freedom. That was actually more than one sentence so I gave you more than I thought I would. This series I remember really really enjoying when I was younger. I read these after I read Akatar. Um, and I was Akatar trash back in the day. You do not understand. I read Akamath in less than 24 hours. I was obsessed with that series. I read those in early grade 8 and then I read these in later grade 8. My first, like, dive into fandom and, like, fandoms on the internet was actually the Sarah J Mass Akatar Throne of Glass <laughs> Instagram community or bookstagram community. I ran a fan page for the two series. I still have the Instagram account. I don't really use it, but that was my first dive into like fan internet communities. And I just love that that was my origin story. And we're gonna, we're gonna complete the circle this summer. But yeah, I really like these. Hindsight, I actually don't like a lot of things in Sarah J. Mass's books. Like looking back on them, like they're all kind of very similar, especially her newer stuff. I'm still reading her newer stuff, like Crescent City. Um, I haven't read the continuation of the Akatar series because I'm scared because I know I'm gonna hate it. But like, I don't know, there's a lot of things that I find problematic or I just don't really enjoy about these books now. So like revisiting them now and having to like reread them all is gonna be probably a challenge at times because I do not feel the same about a lot of things as I did when I was younger. And I've watched and like read a lot of people analyzing different parts of this series especially and like the problematic elements of them. So we'll see how this goes. I don't anticipate rating these like too highly. Like my younger self would have been like five stars all the way. So I don't anticipate that. But I think for all of Sarah J Mass's faults, or faults in my opinion, um, her books are entertaining. <laughs> so at least even if they're not the best, it will be entertaining along the way. But ironically, my next note, which is gonna be my first note on actually like what I've felt about this book so far, um, the beginning of this book has been dry as fuck. I haven't hated it, but like nothing has happened yet. And like, I think finally we're getting into the actual like competition element of Throne of Glass. So I'm excited for that because it's just been kind of like nothing the first hundred pages. And that's not like abnormal for fantasy, but I don't know, I want this show to get on the road. There are parts of this book that I'm actually really excited for, um, mostly Selena. This vlog is gonna have spoilers for this book entirely. I don't know about the whole series. I guess, can I like spoil elements of the whole series? <laughs> because it's hard to talk about this without doing so. I'm gonna do it. So be warned, I'm gonna be spoiling the whole series. Selena is Aelin and 
I don't like Aelin. In my brain, Selena and Aelin are two different people. Like, I love Selena. Aelin, <laughs> I'm not a fan of. So I'm actually, like, kind of excited to revisit this book and Crown of Midnight just to get more Selena content because I just find Selena more of an entertaining character. She doesn't have as much, like, weighing on her soul as Aelin. So, like, she I find her more enjoyable to read. And also, the ships that Selena has, I enjoy more than... Rowan and Aelin. I'm excited for the ship moments in this book so I can see more Salorian because it literally doesn't exist in the other books. And also on Dorian, Dorian is only happy in this book. I think his like joy is dampened from the last page of this book onward. Like even in Crown of Midnight when he's not as traumatized yet, he's still not like the same as this book. Like in this book he really is that like aloof flirtatious like prince character. And in all the other books, he's just very, very sad. <laughs> and I don't like that. I liked him in this book. So I've been enjoying revisiting things that I really enjoyed from the early part of the series before it got too vast and went in directions I didn't enjoy as much. But yeah, welcome to my journey. So I have COVID again. Um, I had it once before in January and I've just discovered that I am positive for it again. There goes the test. It's not that surprising, to be honest, not because I was trying to get it, but because my friend got sick and tested positive, like, three, four days ago now, and then I started getting sick, and I tested negative for, like, the first three days of being symptomatic, but I didn't go anywhere because, like, I suspected that it was COVID. I was going all detective, and I was like, mm, I'm feeling like this is wrong. Uh, lo and behold, finally got that positive test, so I do have COVID. Um, I'm not feeling great to be honest, I'm pretty sick, but it's more just like extreme cold symptoms and flu symptoms, so like, I'm okay, but could be better. But yeah, I'm currently sick and I have the worst lung capacity ever right now, so if you hear me like panting or sound like I'm out of breath, it's because I am. With that being said, I have been reading because I can't really do much else because I'm basically confined to my bedroom and then like whenever my family is not like in the common areas I've been like wandering about to like feed myself and things like that but I have been reading and I'm on page 150 now so I've made some progress this far through. A random note because like I haven't taken them out but these tabs are from when I first originally tried to reread this book. I am annotating as in I do have a pen and I've been writing random stuff in the margins but like I'm not fully annotating because I'm feeling a little bit too lazy for that. I did write myself some notes um, that are very sparse but I'm just gonna go through the list of things starting with ship content which is great i have been and will always be probably a big solorian and samlena shipper because i think those are just the best relationships that selena slash aelin are in in the series and i just don't understand why selena would choose rowan when better options were there and seeing as sam isn't really an option <laughs> I don't get why she doesn't pick Dorian because I love him. Love like their banter and the flirtations between Selena and Dorian. I just find it very like entertaining and I just, that's the kind of dynamic I love. You give me a flirty prince and I will eat that shit up. I know, I know what gets me and that gets me. So I'm really, really loving the Dorian content. And once again, I remember this being a thing when I first read it, but I'm like, I don't know why Selena wouldn't choose that. Because like, think about all the positives, his personality. He's a prince. <laughs> Why wouldn't she want that? I think the reason was because she becomes the king's champion, so she didn't want, like, that conflating or something like that. I don't know. I don't really remember the exact reasoning. Anyway, the reasoning was bad, because I would pick Dorian any day. My next note is Nehemia. Oh my gosh. Okay, Nehemia has been introduced, and the first time I read these books, I didn't care about Nehemia. I didn't, like, dislike her by any means, but I didn't care about her. And now I absolutely love this character. And I think an aspect of why I love her, and this is going to sound really, really um, what, masochistic of me, but I know Nehemia dies, and I feel like my brain knows that, and so now it is latched on to Nehemia, because it's like, I want you to feel pain later. Because I really, really enjoy her this time around. I love her inner motivations. I love her as a character. She's snarky and headstrong. I love that she's disrespecting these Outer Lanian royalty um, and, like, nobles left and right. I just love it, and she's fighting against Outer Lands, like, terrorizing and colonization, and I just absolutely love it. 
so much and she's just such a good character and I wish that I didn't know what happens to her in the next book because it's gonna be really sad when she uh bites the dust so to speak but I'm absolutely loving her and I love her and Selena's relationship a lot um so I'm glad I get to reread that and like actually appreciate this time around because last time I definitely didn't not to say I hated it but definitely didn't like seek it out and now I'm so happy every time we get her scenes like there was a scene of her and Selena um sparring and I just absolutely loved it <sighs> I just love seeing Selena with like a female friend and there's no like competition between them for like a man. My last note, it's Kale. I think I might have mentioned earlier, I might have cut it out though, I might have mentioned that I wasn't hating Kale as much this time around because I notoriously hate Kale a lot. Um, and I gotta rescind that statement, I am hating him again. He just gets on my nerves, he's got such like a stick up his ass and up to the point in the series that I read, which is Empire Storms, he got a little bit better about certain prejudices, especially around like magic use, but he's like not never good, never great. And he's just like, this is the start of his journey and he's just the peak. I actually know, I think he peaks in Crown of Midnight and Air of Fire with his prejudice against magic and stuff like that. But in this one, he's just annoying. And like, do where Dorian is playful and flirtatious and like breaks the rules, Kale is there just like, you can't do that. You can't do this. She's a dangerous assassin. Do -do 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 -do. And I get it. It makes sense. But liven up a bit. Like, he's just so frustrating to me. And he blames Selena for things that aren't her fault. Like, we just had this scene, like I mentioned with Nahemia and Selena, like, sparring. And then Dorian comes in and he starts sparring with Nahemia. And then Kale finds them. And he gets mad at Selena. Like, Dorian's not a big boy and can make his own decisions. And Nahemia's not, like, her own entity and can make her own decisions. Like, he blames Selena for this happening. And it's like, she's just there. There's these two royals. Like, they can make their own decisions and they have more power in the situation than this random fugitive who has been brought here for a specific purpose. Like, he's just, I don't know, Kale frustrates me a lot. But yeah, overall, I would say I am enjoying this book. It's not a five star. Honestly, right now, I feel like I'd give it like a 3.5 or a 4. We'll see how that continues. But there are things I'm really liking revisiting and I'm liking to see how my opinions are changing on certain things, like specifically Nehemia because my feelings on Dorian, the exact same. Absolutely adore him. I'm probably gonna try and make it to page 200 tonight because me and my friend Ava, who also has COVID, she's the one I was mentioning earlier, we're gonna read on FaceTime tonight. So I'm hoping to get to page 200. So hopefully when I update you next, I am in the 200s page mark. Here's Kale's out of pocket quote for the day. In this paragraph about him being interested in Selena and being like, he doesn't call it jealousy, but it's obviously like he's jealous of Dorian. Um, he randomly in this paragraph goes, he was fairly certain she was a virgin. Like, Kale, what the fuck? <laughs> like, Dorian hasn't pondered this on page. You're the only one pondering it, but then you claim like, but Dorian is the kind of guy who'd be interested in that. Dude, you're the one who's pondering it. Also like, have you spoken to Selena? When has Selena ever given off virginal vibes? This is more evidence for me that, uh, I'm like, Kale! You're sitting on my laptop in my lap, so if, like, the camera's moving, sorry about it. I've been basically incapacitated by my period cramps, so I cannot get out of bed. So we're doing the update from bed. I'm on, like, page 302 of this book, and I got a problem. The love triangle in this book is getting, honestly, very distracting. I never really love love triangles, um, but this one is just done exceptionally bad. This love triangle takes, like, flip-flopping to the extreme. We have the ball scene, and Selena is standing with Kale, and she's, like, pissy because she doesn't think, like, Kale's attracted to her, and he doesn't ask her to dance. And then Kale has like a pick me moment where he's like, I know you'd rather be talking to Dorian. And so I was like, no, like you're handsome too. And then she has this whole paragraph where she like describes how handsome Kale is. And she's like, how have I missed it up to this point? And then two paragraphs later, Dorian comes up and she's like, Kale who? And just flips right back. And I just hate that. In my romances and books, I strive for mutual pining. Mutual pining is so... Mmm, tasty. And love triangles actively get in the way of mutual pining because you throw another person in the mix, so you can't devote all your attention to the mutual pining between these two. So, like, it just, they don't work together. And so it's really, like, not fun and it's distracting and it's just disappointing to have a love triangle in general and then this really badly done one because, like, 
there's no commitment to either direction and I think this book is worse for it. I think love triangles usually kind of commit in a certain direction like you kind of can always see who's winning out and like in this case in this book Dorian is winning out but then every time we have like a Dorian Selena scene there'll be like a perspective change and it'll just be Kale the pick me puppy pouting in the yard or pouting and watching Dorian and Selena and I just like hate it it's so infuriating and it's actually like drawing away from my enjoyment of the book honestly i also don't like the fact that dorian and kale's like years upon years long friendship is being like torn apart because they both like this one girl and she shows no commitment to either of them like it's it's not my favorite i don't really like it this book kind of just reeks of like early 2010s i don't know tropes like i feel like every book series that i've read that had a book that started between like 2010 or 2012 like that was published in that range has the same shit that's in this book um like the love triangle and uh, i just don't i don't like it it's making me mad because i'm genuinely enjoying other things in the book but this love triangle thing has like hammed up at this point and it's so frustrating what is with sarah j mass books and just losing it by the end because i was really liking this but now i'm just like peeved with everything but down here where I've underlined really poorly, Selena decides that she was wrong to accuse Nehemia of being the champion murderer and that there's no way it's her, and then goes on to suspect her as the murderer the whole next three pages until it's proven that it's Kane, which has been obvious the whole book, but you know what? Some people take a while to come to these conclusions. Like, Sarah J. Mass, what is happening here with Selena's convictions? She's convinced of something, like, right here, and then goes back on it. Like, it's, it's, like, what is this? So I finished Throne of Glass, and I am unsure about my rating. My original rating, I checked on Goodreads, was a four to five stars. It's definitely not that anymore. Currently, I put it to a three, but, like, it could become a two. I've noticed a pattern with me and Sarah J. Mass's books recently, and that's me absolutely adoring or really enjoying the first 50% of her books as in like the first 50% of the individual book and then the last 50% just like not hitting for me and I think that would kind of rang true with this book as well while I didn't love the first half I did enjoy it and I really like the middle part but then like I mentioned earlier like the love triangle are really distracting and unenjoyable to read and that just kind of like continues on till the end so that got really upsetting for me and annoying. Something I did like about reading this book was getting reminded of things I totally forgot about in the series. Like I totally forgot about word marks because they kind of lose relevancy throughout halfway through the series. Um, I forgot about Elena's part in this book and now knowing like that Selena's Aelin there's a lot of Aelin foreshadowing in this book which like I find fun to read when I'm in on the secret. I forgot about a lot of Nehemia's role in this book. I don't know, just a lot of, like, the details I was definitely not aware of anymore. The final duel between Kane and Selena I really enjoyed reading. I thought it was, like, suspenseful. Even though you kind of know, like, she's gonna win, I liked watching her get her ass beat and then, you know, having to rise up. I love those kind of moments. It's, I'm like a sucker for it when, like, the hero is losing, like, really badly and then they have to, like, pull through in the end really enjoy that kind of stuff. Something that I actually kind of liked about this book was just Kale, Dorian, and Selena in general. They don't really remain the main cast of the books. Like, Aelin kind of assumes a new cast of friends and allies. Like, Kale and Dorian are still there, but they stop being very relevant and stop interacting with Selena slash Aelin a lot. Um, so I really like their interactions in this book, even when they're like stupidly fighting over Selena. I like Kale and Dorian and like their relationship with Selena, so I think it's kind of a loss that we lose that in the rest of the series because they kind of become more distant, they have other stuff going on in different places. Overall, knowing like the general plot of this series, this book really feels like a prequel and I think Crown of Midnight will as well. Um, Sarah J Mass, especially with like Akatar and Throne of Glass, like Akatar feels like a prequel to the rest of the books. Crown of Midnight and Throne of Glass have always felt like a prequel to the rest of the series because the plot really like becomes really vast after the first two books and it like focuses on stuff that is not even like a thing in this book. I think Sarah J Mass has a tendency to ease you in to the world with like the first book or first few books um, with like contained plot lines and then just blow it up into like a world shattering plot line in the end which I guess like that's fine I don't hate that but just like this series feels so different by the end of it than this book so it was kind of jarring to go back to this when I kind of know where it goes but overall I finished it and that's what counts. I'm nervous to read Crown of Midnight because I don't know how Kaylin is gonna go for me. I don't really like Kale, but like, 
unfortunately i don't like him but then he has some really good emotional moments like in this book there's two moments i can think of that are like really good emotional moments with kale and i'm like serious you can't give me this character whom i kind of loathe and then also give him emotional moments that i love it doesn't like it doesn't work in my mind. Basically, I'm really nervous to have to read a lot of Kale in the next book because I see it as inevitable. And I kind of don't remember if anything substantial happens in Crown of Midnight. Like, I know the obvious, like, magic and alien thing, but like, what's the plot of Crown of Midnight? What even happens? I don't know. But I will find out soon, I think. I'm not reading Crown of Midnight just yet. I can pick up the book, actually. I'm not reading it quite yet. I'm planning to read like one or two other things in between and get back to this by the end of the month maybe so i'm trying to stay like relatively fast with continuing but i need a break because this became kind of exhausting by the end but yeah this has been the beginning of my throne of glass reread and i think it started off on a good foot the perfect foot maybe not because not a five star read but a solid foot nonetheless to wrap it all up i've been bailey Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you later. Bye!